Good morning, fellowship class. Good to be with you again this morning. Hope everybody's doing well. You know, everybody's keeping themselves safe, staying safe from this coronavirus. Our lesson today comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 21 through 35. The, enti- the title of our lesson is called Compassion Demonstrated. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and just prevent your, present your word to our class, Father. We just pray, Father, that you'll guide my heart and my mind. you have their hearts open and receptive to the teaching of your word, Father. We ask for your guidance and direction and strength to do those things you call us to do. Be with our church, guide and direct and lead it, Father. Help it through this time of, of, of crisis, Father. Give us strength and guidance to do the things you call us to do. Help each one of us be the witness you call us to be. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Our scripture, like I said, comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 21 through 35. Let's read those scriptures if we can right now. It says, My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in the ways safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid, yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolations of wicked, when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Without, without good, not, withhold not good from the, them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go, and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when thou hast it by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with thee a man without cause, if he have done them no, if he have done thee no harm. Envy not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the, forward is, for, the, for the forward is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is, on, is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitations of the just. Surely he, cometh, he, surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace to the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be upon the promotion of of fools. As I mentioned, our lesson today is entitled Compassion Demonstrated. Let me ask you a question here as we look at these, chapter 3, verses 21 through 35, our discussion here. Has there ever been a good time or a good experience you ever had with a neighbor? Has there been able to reach out to help somebody, to re- look out for them? Now, I don't just mean a neighbor who lives next door. It's somebody you may have run, to, run into somewhere in your travels or your uh, in in around your uh, business that you take care of and all, have you ever had that good experience with that person? That is something that you've done. So remember, it's not just that person, but that person who lives next door to you that we're talking about. Anybody that you meet is considered to be your neighbor. Jesus was asked, Master, which is the great commandment of, uh, in the law? And Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is likened unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the halal and the prophet. This is found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, if you want to take a chance to read that. Last week we studied the section of Proverbs that examined the trust and honor must be a, must accompany a relationship with, our, with, our, with God as we live before him and live with him. This week, we will see how our relationship with God is, influences our relationship with others. And that's what we'll be looking at today. Our first part of our lesson is called Confidence Gain, about Proverbs chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Solomon explained that the person who trusts the Lord will find rest with, uh, from fear. The person who seeks to harm a faithful fellow of God is in, a, in his opposition to God. So be careful what you do and what you say to other people. You don't want to be in opposition with God. If we fear being mistreated by wicked people, it can cause us to fail to act and minister to the 
needs of, other, of others around us or others we meet. We must, be, we must let God be in control of all parts of our lives. Let's read these verses that relate to this section. We're starting with verse 21. It says, My son, let not them depart from thine heart, eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in the way safely, and thy feet shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of dissolutions of the wicked and, and when, it come, when it cometh. For the Lord shall be with thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from the being taken. Is it wrong to be have fear? Think about that a minute. Is it wrong to have fear? No, we're all human beings. We all have opportunity, the chances that we may have fear at times in our lives. So how might fear be related to our trust in God? You know, when we trust God and really trust God, we need to trust in Him that He'll take care of every situation. We should have no fear, but you know, it's just human nature, and it's where we are right now. We're not perfect yet. It's not until we go home to be with the Lord that we'll be perfect. Fear can be a, a, a healthy response to danger sometimes. However, we don't need to be overcome with fear. We need to make sure we have control of ourselves and we let God control our lives. In verse 26, we see that our confidence and safety come from the trust in God, not from trusting our own abilities to avoid all dangers. You know, we can't always avoid danger sometimes. We cannot always a situation that may cause fear in our lives. But we need to trust God to take care of us and have our confidence in Him that He is taking care of us. And His hand is upon us and leading us in the way we need to go. However, we also use God giving wisdom and judgment when we look at these situations also. Don't just go at it with an, with an, un -open, with an un with open mind with no control on it and all. Let God have control of your mind. How might fear prevent us from loving our neighbors? You know, sometimes we're afraid, don't know who they are. We don't know what kind of person they might be or something like that. Or people we may meet somewhere as we go in different places. We just meet them for the first time. We can find out a little bit, start talking to them, find out a little bit about them then, start learning more about them. But we really don't know the total, total history of that individual. But don't let fear keep you from being able to t discuss and to, to talk with other people and to have conversations to find out more about them. Also, to give you the opportunity to, to, to witness to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. The fear that wicked people might minister, the fear that excuse me, the fear that wicked people might mistreat us can keep us from reaching out to others and to helping others. You know, we've got to be a, a confidence in God that God is leading us to the right person in the right direction, that He's taking care of us. According to these verses, why don't we need to fear? And according to this, the wicked are in opposition to God, and He sees them. We don't need to fear because we have God with us in everything that we do. God offers his peace to those who trust him. Do you trust him today? Are you trusting him for whatever situation in your life? Here are some verses to help us overcome fear. Psalms 23 verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's a great comfort that we have from the book of Psalms, chapter 23, verse number 4. That God is with us in everything we do. His staff will protect us, and we have comfort with his staff. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2 says, But now, thus saith the Lord, that created thee, o, created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not thou, for thou have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, and thou art mine. Verse 2 says, When thou passest through the, the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, there shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shalt the flame kindle upon thee. That's a promise God gives us, that he'll protect us in whatever situation we may be going through. Remember, he's always with us. He's always taking care of us. His hand up upon us. And you know, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, his Holy Spirit came to live within us, and that helps us to overcome any type of fear that we may have. It helps us to, help us to do the things that God wants us to do, that we might be a witness, Father, for him, and everything that we do, that we might glorify his name above every, every name. We find that God's word gives us the courage and direction to face all situations. Our second part of our lesson is called it Kindness Express, verses of uh, chapter 3, verse 27 through 30. Solomon directed God's people to act quickly. 
to help their neighbors and to never abuse their trust or put harm against them. Solomon teaches that teachings are not a license to mistreat others, though, not to mistreat strangers, but to honor and honor them and meet with them and understand who they are, that they are just another person just like you. And they may be just as much as scared of you as you are as scared of them. There are many times that strangers will be considered to be our neighbor, and we don't realize that sometimes. But when we meet somebody on the street, he is our neighbor. If we're able to meet with him and cordially and talk with him and get a greater understanding of who he is, and he can understand more about us, we should treat them with respect in every way. Verse 27 says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is is due that it is in the power of thine hand to do it verse 20 says say say not unto thy neighbor go and come again and tomorrow i will give when thou hast it by thee verse 29 says devise not evil against thy neighbor seeing he walketh securely or dwelleth securely by thee in other words if your neighbor lives next door he has your the assurance of your protection and your love for him and your concern for him and you'll take care of it and you'll report things to him too. It's just like the other night Linda told me about our neighbor across the street. Her garage door was standing open and it was pretty late at night and I called over and, ta- and left a message on the phone. She didn't answer the phone right away. I told her that her garage door was open. We just noticed it as we went to bed that night. Now I got to watch out the window and then here with the garage door down and she called me. said she appreciated me calling, letting her know that her garage door was open. She hadn't even been out all day. That door had probably been open for a day and a half and she didn't know it. So verse 30 says, Strive not with a man without cause if he, if he have done thee no harm. What excuses might people use to avoid helping others? Have you ever made up excuses in your own lifestyle and what you do to keep from having to work for, or do something for somebody or reach out to help somebody or give them some kind of guidance or allegiance in what they're doing? Sometimes people plan to do, plan to do it later, meaning help when the time is more convenient or when they have more means to do so. Often that time never comes though, and we wind up being that we've have, have failed our neighbor and taken care of them. Verses 27 through 28 calls for immediate action. Delayed action can be called disobedience. And that's a lot, of, a lot of our situation now. When we delay actions and don't obey God and what he leads us to do, we are disobedient to God. These verses, this, these verses instruct believers to act responsibly in their giving, honoring God with what they have. And sometimes what we have is what we can do, not necessarily what we hold in our hands or by means of other money or anything like that. So what do these verses tell you about living in the kingdom of God? God is ruling here and now, and we are in his kingdom now. We sometimes wonder, well, we'll be in the kingdom someday. But, you know, when you accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, you became a part of his kingdom. You are in God's kingdom right now. Though we are, we also look forward to a more perfect kingdom in, in, in eternity. And that would be the perfect kingdom when nothing is wrong. There would be no problem, no problem of fear or anything like that. Everything would be true as God has placed it before us. What significance about Solomon's emphasis on neighbors who oppose to let so me read this again. What's significant about Solomon's emphasizing neighbors who oppose to people in, in general or oppose to people in general? Well, when you speak about neighbors as somebody you know, somebody you can trust, somebody you can look to, it may be somebody you've just met and met that you may have a favor with them to where you have, when you've met them, get a greater understanding who they are, what their, what their uh, abilities are, what they're doing in life, where they're at right now. And you might have the opportunity, like I said, to speak to them later about their Lord Jesus Christ if they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can find out whether or not they're a Christian or not. What does this mean for how we treat our strangers then? Like I said, we have the opportunity to meet with strangers in every place, and those strangers can become our neighbors, people we know, that we come to know. Refer to, let's look, look at the parable of the, uh, let's refer to the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, 25 through 37. Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? He responded with a parable that demonstrates the answer to that question. Are we acting like a good neighbor as, as in the Good Samaritan? where the Samaritan man saw a man laying on the side of the road, on the other side of the road where he was traveling, and he went over to take care of the man, even though the man had been bypassed by two or three, two other people and I, they had come down that road, one a Pharisee and one a, a, uh, another man, a, good, a higher influential man. 
But then a Samaritan comes along. The people that the Israelites even hated that day. But he came on. He took care of the man. He doctored his wounds. He took him and put him into a room somewhere where he could heal up himself now. The Lord neighbor, neighbor isn't limited to people who are like us and live near us. They are anybody who we come in contact with. I know I've repeated that several times, but I think it's important. We need to understand that a neighbor is just not the person who lives next door. It's not somebody we know as, as, from a normal relationship and all. But it's the person that we may come in contact with as we travel the roads or we may be out in a store somewhere and run into somebody and they make a comment to us. We really speak back to them. Then we get time to find out who they are and get a chance to speak to them and, and to witness to them and everything we do and everything we say. Jesus says we're a neighbor when we treat others with mercy. And that's one thing we need to remember. We are a neighbor when we treat others with mercy. If we don't treat others with mercy, then we're not the neighbor we think we are. First, third part of our list is called Blessings Secured. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. Solomon warned about desiring the possessions of the wealthy who are, are secured their thought through violence and wickedness. He emphasizes that God blesses the righteous, offers them offering them his grace and honor. God immediately knows the upright person, and he knows each one of us what our situations are. He's with us wherever we go. His Holy Spirit's always living within us. He knows how, what kind of person we are. He knows how we act. He knows how we treat other people. And we need to realize that he does know that. And whenever we meet somebody, we need to represent the relationship that Jesus Christ when he was on this earth how he loved all people and he took care of all people even reaching out to those who were unworthy of some time of his touch but he laid his hands upon them no matter what condition they were in verse 31 says envy thou not the oppressor and choose not his of his ways for the forward is abomination to the Lord but his secret is with the righteous the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked but the blessing, but he blesseth the, the habitation of the just. Surely he cometh, excuse me, he, surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. The wise shall inherit God, a glory, but shame shall be the pro proportion of the fools. We might, why might people be treated to envy a right of, Excuse me again. Why might people be tempted to envy a violent man and choose his ways? Sometimes we think he's more prosperous than we are. He's got more goods than we have. He's richer than we are. And we want some of that. But you know what that is? That's pride in our part that we look have more of what those people have. We're envious of that individual. Why be envious of a man who's taking it by, by, by force or out unevenly or unlawfully? The wicked who are without some, some are with or take a deep breath. The wicked who are violent sometimes seem to prosper with wealth. Have you noticed that? That sometimes people you know to be wicked are doing better than you are sometimes. It seems like they're doing a whole lot better than you are, but really they are not doing any better than you are. The fact they're not doing as good as you are because they're not in the, in the will of God what they're doing. If you're in the will of God, you're in God's family. You're, you're, you've been led, led to a relationship with Jesus Christ and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. That wicked person is not in the relationship with Jesus Christ. He's not going to be in heaven unless he changes his ways and repents of his sin and comes to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Consider some ways people or groups may be benefiting from violence and wickedness without taking part in the violence directly. You know, sometimes we, that happens to us when we try, we see something somebody likes and even try to sell it to us. We don't know how they got it, but maybe we like it so much that we go ahead and buy the thing. Well, we just have to uh, uh, develop an income for that individual for something he didn't rightly own. What re reasons did Solomon give for avoiding this temptation? Solomon reminded us that the Lord's attitude toward the wicked and, and toward the upright, what, the, what it was. What can, what can help us overcome this temptation? We must remember that God sees us. And if we live our lives in a relationship that God sees us, everything we do, everything we say, he hears, and everything we do, he sees that, and how, it's turned, how it turns out and all. He sees the ones we talk to, who we uh, respect and, take and, and, and spend time with. We don't always experience immediate benefits, and we are to keep eternity in mind when we think about these things. 
Without eternity, we have nothing. But we know by accepting Jesus Christ into our heart, His Holy Spirit now lives within us. We now have a home in eternity. But even though we are in eternity right now, we are in the kingdom of God because we have accepted Jesus Christ. But it's not the perfect kingdom yet. And one day when we go home to be with the Lord, we will be in that perfect kingdom. Let's read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 as we consider Jesus' example of humility and service. So let this man be in you, which was always which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made into the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. So wherefore God hath also hath rightly highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that name, at that name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, all things in heaven and everything in the earth and everything under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God and to the Father of the Father. As we finish our lesson today, let's look back at some things in our conclusion here. You know, following God's wisdom is it is demonstrated in how we treat others. And we not realize when, when we're following God's wisdom, when we listen to what God says, tell us, and how we live our lives and how we treat other people, we must understand that God sees what we're doing. Following God's wisdom is demonstrated in how we treat others. That's what it, that, that is why this lesson is all, that's what this lesson is all about. How we treat others in the sight of God. How are you treating others in the sight of God? First part of our lesson, God offers his, his peace to those who trust him. You know, it's good to trust in Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and to know that we have that peace with Him, that peace within us. We don't have fear from because of that. God expects His people to treat others with kindness. You know, that's the responsibility God gives us. We must treat those we know with kindness and those we meet with kindness. And even those we don't know, treat them with kindness. We are to be kind because God, Jesus Christ was kind. He never had a foul word against anybody, as you remember in Scripture. First third part of our lesson was God blesses those who know him. Do you know God? Are you serving him today? Is he your Lord and Savior? If he is, then God bless you. And if he's not, then I pray, for, pray that you'll come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For it's ever eternally too late. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us, that we're able to come together and to study your word, Father. We ask, Father, that the teaching we've given today has been an inspiration to those that have heard it. They've been able to take it into their hearts. And if there's a mistake made in what I said, I pray, Father, that you'll correct it in their hearts and in their minds, Father. I know, Father, that I need to look a little closer sometimes, but, you know, it's, it's awful hard sometimes to teach a lesson like this because we have nobody we're looking at. But we thank you, Father, that you get know that we know that they're listening and watching it later on. And we thank you, Father, for loving us and caring for us and providing for our needs, Father. Pray, Father, continue to strengthen us and guide us and lead us in all that we do. Let us be that witness you call us to be. Let us be the, the teacher you want us to be, Father. And help us, Father, to ever be mindful of your presence with us, that you are with us at all times, that your Holy Spirit lives within us, and that we do trust you for everything that goes on in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.